happy Sabbath. Um, well, let's open up our scripture to Matthew 27 and the verses 3, 4, 11, 17, 24, and 25. Mouthful. Um, so let us hear what the Lord has to say for us this morning. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned, and in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest, Therefore, when thy were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas, or Jesus, which is called Christ? When Pilate said that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and our children. And the word of the Lord. Let's try that again. Happy Sabbath, church. Better response. How are you all doing? How are you all doing? Good. It's Memorial Day weekend. It's time to remember what Jesus has done for us. Amen? That's why we're here. Um, I want to thank Pastor Rodney, Pastor Rosetti, and the pastoral staff who have given me the opportunity um, to be here and to speak to you from this holy pulpit. And I want to thank Pastor Rodney who has bringing me a cup of water. Two cups. Wow. You're definitely going to the kingdom. Um... It's an honor, it's a joy to use the gifts and talents which God has given one for his glory. And so I want to be as careful as I can be to not say anything from my own behalf. But the words that I speak, I wish it to be the words of the Lord. Amen. Um, I see some really familiar faces in the crowd. To you they're new, but to me they're familiar. Um, one specific one, I was, oh, every song we sang this morning... I guarantee you, I was up in the morning and I was listening to the Gaithers. I don't know if you guys know the Gaithers. I was YouTubing them. I listened to every single song. We saw, ironic. And then we were doing um, children's story and she was playing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I know, I'm off. Um, and it brought back nostalgic memories because that's probably the very first song I've ever learned. At VBS, back in 1995, six, and my VBS teacher at that time is here today. Ooh, hoo, hoo, which one is it? <laughs> I guarantee you, it's the one you don't see every week. So, <laughs> she's in the back. Hi, Aros. That's her waving at me. Um, she has been the very first person to really teach me the love of Jesus. And so I appreciate her being here with her husband. Um, and I'm thankful for everyone else to be here. Our message is entitled, let's see here, does this work? Judas, Pilate, Barabbas. Um, I wanted to speak on Judas, and then it just turned out to be on Pilate and Barabbas. Ever since I can remember watching the movies, watching the cartoons, uh, the director somehow portrayed Judas to be this evil, malicious, violent dude who deserved to hang himself and die. Have you guys ever um, felt that way as you watch the movies that, yeah, Judas deserved to die? Has anyone else felt that way? Or is it just me? I just hear murmurs, so I guess it's just me and maybe it's some, some of you. Um, but yeah, I, I just didn't like that. I didn't like the way the, the director was portraying Judas and it didn't settle with me. I, I felt so bad for the guy. And so throughout the years of me studying the Bible, throughout the years of me reading the stories and, 
and listening to sermons and, and whatnot, I've been taking little things from each little story, each little sermon, and I want to share with you some of the things that I've learned. And we're going to look at Judas, and then we're going to look at Pilate, we're going to look at Barabbas, and we're going to see at the end what we can extrapolate from the text. Is that fair? Okay, so before we begin, what do you think we're going to do? That's right, so let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for the opportunity to be up here and speak for you. For I am dust, but with your breath of life, you have brought life and hope into my life. And I just pray right now, Lord, as we open up the scriptures, that you open our hearts. And that you will condescend, not into this very room, but into our very own minds and our hearts. And that you will reveal yourself to us. That when we leave this place, we will have encountered the Lord in a special way. So, Lord, please take a hold of my lips and the words that will proceed out of my mouth. And may they bless and help every single person in this church to say, I have seen the love of Jesus. Thank you for the promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Let everyone say, Amen. So let us open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. What we're going to do is we're going to basically go through the first 26 verses of Matthew 27, and we're going to dissect verse by verse what's happening. But before we do that, I want to um, give you uh, a backdrop of what's taking place here. Um, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He has prayed to the Father that this cup pass and it doesn't pass, and then the Mob comes and they take Jesus away and the disciples are terrified, they're incredulous, they're beside themselves that their Lord and Savior who has always been in control of the situation is somehow being taken away. And so out of fear, out of just sheer terror, they run away. They disperse to every corner and I can just imagine Peter saying, everyone save yourself. And they just run away. And Jesus is taken that night to the trial. So with that story, that backdrop in our minds, let us open the scriptures to Matthew 27, and let us read from verse 1. I'm so excited I forgot my notes are here. I hope I don't use them. 13 pages. All right, Matthew chapter 27, beginning from verse 1, the Bible says, When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. So Jesus has just gone through a mockery of a trial. It was an illegal trial. It happened in midnight. The Sanhedrin was not fully there. And so they brought false accusers, false witnesses to get Jesus um, to trap him. You know, no one really agreed on anything. And then someone came and said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus, he said he's going to tear down the temple. He'll rebuild it in three days. And then the high priest is beside himself. He's credulous. He just rents his robe and says, blasphemy. And, and the religious leaders are trying to come up with a way how to get rid of this provocative rabbi who's just ruining everything that they've been trying to uh, fix. And so they're not just thinking of a temporary relief to sequester him off into some rural place in the land, but they want to permanently get rid of Jesus. So they're trying to come up with a scheme to get rid of Jesus. Verse 2. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. This word keeps coming up again and again, again and again, again and again. Delivered, delivered, delivered. Jesus said, the son of man must be delivered. Judas said to the high priest, I will deliver him to you. There's something intentional about a delivery. When you receive a delivery, you are expecting it. I mean, someone is sending it to you. There's aim, there's goal, there's a purpose, there's intention, there's teleology there. And so Jesus is being delivered. And he's not really being delivered by Judas. And he's not really being delivered by the religious leaders. And nor will he be really being delivered by Pontius Pilate. Jesus himself had said, no one can take my life away from me. I lay it down myself. And so Jesus isn't going through some circuitous, you know, willy-nilly kind of path. He's being delivered from point A to B, from B to C, from C to D. And he knows exactly where he is going. 
In the Garden of Gethsemane when the mob came to take Jesus away and Peter took out his sword out of his sheath to chop the heads off the Romans, Jesus said, Peter, what are you doing? Don't you think right now I can pray to the Father and he will send a legion of angels? Jesus has always been in control. So this delivery, if you will, is not, you know, no one is forcing Jesus. He's not kicking and screaming against his will. It's a consensual delivery. He is uh, allowing himself to be delivered. It's a voluntary delivery, and he knows exactly where he is going. The religious leaders think that they are the ones, yeah, 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 yeah. We're delivering Jesus to Pilate. But they don't know, they're just capitulating to the very plan of God which he foresaw eons ago. Verse 3. Now we're introduced to Judas, and from verse 3 to verse 10, these next eight verses, we will be focusing on Judas, and he will be the main bulk of the message. Verse 3. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the where, everyone? In the temple. That is key. This interaction, this transaction, this conversation is happening in the temple. Where is it happening? In the temple. That's going to be key to, to the message. Verse 5, he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple, and he departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury, because they are the price of blood. So they consulted together and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Verse 9, then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Even in this tragic scene, even in this sad scene of the betrayal of Judas, of Jesus, Matthew does not want to miss the point that even this tragic event is a prophecy that's being fulfilled from the Old Testament. He wants the reader to know that this betrayal isn't just a betrayal. This is happening because the Old Testament prophets had prophesied. Now, as I was, I was reading the chapter 27 on Judas, I wanted to see what Ellen White had to write on this very chapter in the classic volume, Desire of Ages. My all-time favorite book outside the Bible. Um... Every time I read it, I just fall in love with Jesus even more. So I said, I wonder what Ellen White has to say on this very guy, on, on Judas. So I went to the chapter on Judas, and I began to analyze, and I said, are there any indicators? Are there any markers? Um, are there any waypoints? Could we, if we had not known the end, if we didn't know how the story was going to end, could we have somehow diagnosed the situation? Could we have um, seen something that would arouse our suspicions? And I love how Ellen White takes the text of Scripture that we often read and we just overlook, and she uses the Scripture and says, here's something that's a little off, and, and here's something that's a little off, and, and here's something else that's a little off. So when we come to the culmination of this thing, it's like it's expected. The logical, reasonable end would be that Judas would be betraying his master. So what I want to do with you right now is I want to share with you some choice passages from the book Desire of Ages that will help us to see how in the three and a half years of the ministry of Jesus, how Judas was, there was some things off a little here and some things off a little here. So when we put all these things together, we have this picture. Judas had planned that John the Baptist should be delivered from prison. This goes way back into the early ministry of Christ. When John the Baptist was arrested, Judas was like, yeah, 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 we're going to save John out of prison. But lo, John was left to be beheaded. And Jesus, instead of asserting his royal right and avenging the death of John, retired with his disciples into a country place. And Judas wanted more aggressive warfare. 
this is probably the first time that Judas begins to kind of second guess the decision making of Jesus, right? Ah, oh, Jesus, what are you doing? This is John. This is your cousin. You're only six months apart. What are you doing? We got to take the situation by force. We got to take the situation by violence. Let's go free John. And Jesus just retires. Judas was the first to take advantage of the enthusiasm excited by the miracle of the loaves. If you remember the story of how Jesus, I mean, we just even talked about it right here, how Jesus took the loaves and he blessed it and just two, three, four, five loaves became like many loaves for 5,000 to eat, right? It says that he was right behind this. He was like, yeah, let's do this. It was he who set on foot the project to take Christ by force and make him king. When the people ate the food and they, and they ushered towards Jesus, like, yeah, yeah, let's make Jesus king, Judas was right behind this movement. And you could just imagine why. Hey, if we go to war with the Romans, if we have very little food, this guy can pray to the Father and the little food can become multitude of food. There's no way we'll lose. So you can see his excitement, why he wants to, you know, do this. Christ's discourse in the synagogue concerning the bread of life was the, now check this out, the turning point in the history of Judas. Matthew doesn't touch upon this, but John does. In John 6 where Jesus goes into the synagogue and says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have what? Not in you. You have no eternal life. Right? And, and, and Judas was like, mm -hmm, this is not the Messiah train I want to be on. You know, this is where Jews like, I don't know, man, Jesus is, something is weird. And, and you get to read the chapter, it says, many of his disciples walked with him no more. It offended their Jewish sensitivity. And, and Judas is like, yeah, Jesus, I know you're powerful. I've seen some really cool stuff. The demoniacs have been uh, released from their uh, captivity. You've been healing the sick. I've seen some really cool stuff. But all this talk about eating flesh, all this talk about drinking blood, this is just too much. I, I, I can't. I, I just can't. So she says this was the turning point in the history of Judas. When Jesus presented to the rich young ruler the condition of discipleship, Judas was displeased. He thought that a mistake had been made. The story tells us in Luke 18, 18, that the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. And the rich young ruler leaves sorrowfully because he was very rich. And Judas goes, oh, Jesus, you blew it again. What are you doing, man? This guy is the rich Young ruler, he has connections, he has money, he has networking. We could have used him to further the kingdom of the God. What are you doing? Oh, you blew it up again, Jesus. He thought that a mistake had been made. If such men as the ruler could be connected with the believers, they would help sustain Christ's cause, thought Judas. Yet Judas made no open opposition nor seemed to question the Savior's lessons. He made no outward murmur until the time of the feast in Simon's house. You know the story. They're at Simon's house, and Mary comes in, and she takes the alabaster jar, and she breaks it, and she begins to anoint the feet of Jesus, and she's washing the feet of Jesus, and Jesus is affirming the woman's anointing. The Jesus is affirming the woman's devotion. And Judas is like, hey, 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 what are you doing? We could have sold that and given to the poor. We could have used that for the kingdom. And for the first time, you see this tension between Jesus and Judas. It's been building up. It's been just boiling inside of him. And when Mary, a woman, no less, does this act of devotion, this is like, oh, no way. I got to say something, right? He has to say something. When Mary anointed the Savior's feet, Judas manifested his covetous disposition. But, she says, Judas was not yet wholly hardened. There was still an openness there. Even after he twice pledged himself to betray the Savior, there was opportunity for repentance. At the Passover supper, Jesus proved his divinity by revealing the traitor's purpose. He tenderly included Jesus in the ministry of the disciples. 
All along, Jesus knows that Judas is going to betray him. All along, at every juncture, at every waypoint, Jesus knows that Judas is going to betray him. So he's trying. He's appealing. He's inviting Judas. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is, is approached by the mob and Judas comes and betrays him with an insincere kiss, I find it very ironic that Mary Magdalene was kissing the feet of Jesus with sincerity, but his own friend was betraying him with an insincere kiss. Right? And, and the response of Jesus to Judas is just fraught with significance, fraught with appeal, fraught with invitation. He says, friend, my friend, friend, my friend and companion for all these years, what are you doing here? My friend. Even there, there's an invitation, there's an appeal, there's an openness. Jesus is trying to work with Judas. Judas did not, however, believe that Christ would permit himself to be arrested. Judas, just like the rest of the disciples, did not for a second think that Christ would allow himself to be arrested. Right? Judas believes that Christ is too timid, he's too retiring, he's too reserved, too humble, uh, too modest. Right? And, and so he, in a weird, strange way, wants to help Jesus to assert his divinity, to assert his powerful divinity to the people. So he's going to create a situation. He's going to force the issue on trying to push Jesus into coming out and fully rele revealing himself as the Messiah so then they can start chopping off the heads of the Romans and put Israel back on the spot. Right? He does not, I mean... For a first century Jew, it was inconceivable for the Messiah to be put on a Roman instrument of torture on the cross. So he doesn't think this for a moment that Jesus would allow himself to be arrested. Since he had escaped so many snares, thought Judas, he certainly would not allow himself to be taken. He fully believed that Christ would escape out of their hands. You've read the stories, you've seen the movies, right? When Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Then they picked up stones to do what? To stone him. And Jesus did just what he did always. He made the great escape. When he goes into his hometown and, and they try to push him off a cliff, Jesus does the escape. He escapes. So in the mind of Judas, he thinks that Jesus is too humble, too timid, too modest, too reserving, too retiring. I'm going to help Jesus out. I'm going to push him to a place where he can finally assert his divinity. But lo, that's not what happens, does it? Judas decided to put the matter to the test. If Jesus really was the Messiah... The people for whom he had done so much would rally about him and would proclaim him king. This would forever settle many minds that were now in uncertainty. In amazement, he saw that the Savior suffered himself to be led away. But as hour after hour went by, and Judas is right there, he's assessing the situation. He's trying to stay abreast of what's happening. He's going to the trial, and he's seeing that, no, Jesus isn't asserting himself. As hour after hour went by, and Jesus submitted to all the abuse heaped upon him. A, now check this out. Look what she says. A terrible fear came to the traitor that he had sold his master to his death. When, when the plan miserably backfires and when Judas realizes that the plan he had has miserably backfired, he goes back and he takes the 30 pieces of silver and he comes to the priest and he says, I have sinned. Now the significance of this is purposeful. Is what? Matthew is not just stumbling upon this point. What is the response of the religious leaders to Judas when he comes and says, I have sinned, I have betrayed innocent blood, I have made a giant mistake? What is their response? It's none of our business, mate. Go see that to yourself. Don't bring your messy betrayal, don't bring your messy confessions to us. Hey, we're the priests, and this is the temple. What do you think this place is for? For sin, for guilt, for shame? You see, Matthew didn't stumble upon this point. This is the very point 
that Matthew is making. That a sinner who has made a terrible mistake, has violated his own conscience, comes to the priest. Comes to the who? The priests. I mean, the priests was, were the ones who were interceding on behalf of man and God. They were the ones who were offering forgiveness. They were the ones who were mediating. They were the ones who were giving mercy and grace. And he comes to the temple. The temple was the place where God was working and his presence was found and salvation was rarely acceptable. He comes to the priest and he comes to the temple and the priest cannot be bothered. You see to it. You go take care of your own sin. You go take care of your own guilt. You go take care of your own shame. This is Matthew's point. The temple stands in stark contrast to who? To Jesus. All throughout the book of Matthew, he's making this case from the very first chapters where the angel of God comes to Mary and says, hey, you're a virgin, you're going to conceive of the Holy Ghost, and you're going to call his name what? No, you're going to call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And Matthew is building this point that the temple used to be a place where God was working. The temple used to be a place of God's salvation. The temple used to be a place of God's presence. The temple used to be a place of forgiveness and mercy and love. But that no longer is the case. Jesus is the place for forgiveness. He's the place of uh, salvation. He's the place of God's presence. That is what Matthew is building all along. And so here we have this, this purposeful writing by Matthew that a sinner comes to the temple, the place where God was working, comes to the priest, the people who represented God, and is asking, forgive me, I have sinned, I have done something wrong. He knows that this is the place where sin is supposed to be forgiven. He knows these are the people who are supposed to forgive sin. And what is the response? See that to yourself, mate. It's none of our business. Is there any wonder he commits suicide? All throughout the book of Matthew, we have this, this juxtaposition between the temple and Jesus. Let's, let's look at some. The temple versus Jesus. Jesus cleanses the temple. He walks in and he sees that they have turned his father's house into a den of thieves. Right? The money changers are there. They're doing economics. And so he flips over the money changers and he says, you have turned my father's house into a den of what? Den of thieves. He prophetically halts the temple activities. He says, this is no longer supposed to happen in my house, in my dad's house. Stop it. He then invites the blind and the lame and heals them in the temple. Effectively saying, what should be happening here is love and justice and mercy and healing and restoration. But what's happening is just mere economics. Number four, he leaves the temple and returns the next day to see if the seeds that he had sown had taken any root in the hearts of the religious leaders. And when he sees it has not, number five, he tells parables and diagnoses the religious leaders and all of those diagnoses end with judgment. The prophetic woes, that's Matthew 21, Matthew 22, Matthew 23. He says, fools and blind, fools and blind, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, woe unto you. And then, after three and a half years later of them rejecting his identity as the Messiah, he walks into the temple and he says, your house, your house is left unto you. And then he reaches back into the book of Daniel and he takes that pregnant word and he says, your house is left to you desolate. That's the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet. He says, your house. Remember when he walked in the first time in his ministry, he said, take these things away. You have turned my dad's house into a den of thieves. This is my house. This is my dad's house. Don't do this. Three and a half years later, after persistent and consistent pleading and revealing his identity as the Messiah, when they reject him, he says, this is no longer my house. This is no longer my dad's house. This is your house. And it's left unto you what? Desolate. When the living, breathing, fleshly temple Jesus exits the cedar, the marble, the gold, the great edifice temple, he says it's desolate. And then he leaves with a broken heart. He's sad. He's melancholy. And he winds his way up into the mountain. And the disciples say, oh, man, we got to cheer Jesus up. He's too brokenhearted. And, I mean, guys, I mean, we just don't know emotional sensitivity. And we go, oh, they say, Jesus, um, look at the temple, man. Look at the sun hitting it and the beautiful marble and the way it glows. And Jesus goes, let me tell you something, guys. Let me tell you something. You see all that? It is going to be destroyed. And he foretells the temple's destruction. 
He says, not one stone will be what? Will be left upon another. That's a prophecy. Not one stone will be left upon another. 39 years later, when the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem, the command was to kill everyone. Moms were eating their kids, by the way. That's what history tells us. That's how bad it was. When they surrounded the city, the command was do not destroy the temple. It's beautiful. In the warfare, somehow a torch got into the temple and it began to burn it from the inside. Now you're thinking, so what? Well, it was made out of marble, but the inside was of pure gold. What happens to gold when it touches fire? It begins to melt, right? And so when the Roman army afterwards came and they saw how the gold was melted in, in the temple, greed, you know, the heart is greedy. Hey, we got to get this gold. How do we get this gold? I got an idea. Let's take each stone on top of another and just remove it. So every stone was removed to remove the gold from the temple. And thus fulfilling the prophecy that Jesus said, now one stone will be left upon another. Four more. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the mob comes with, with clubs and swords and violence, and they're going to take Jesus away. And what is the response of Jesus? What does he say? Every day I start teaching where? See, this is purposeful. Matthew is saying Jesus versus the temple. Jesus versus the temple. Jesus versus the temple. Hey, I was teaching every day in the temple. Why didn't you take me then? Now you're going to come and take me by force with violence, with swords and clubs? Hey, why don't you just invite me to your party? And then number 10, he's accused of blasphemy, you guessed it, against the, when they couldn't get two guys to agree on anything, they said, yeah, 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 Jesus, he says he's going to tear down this temple and build it up in three days. He blasphemed against the temple. Number 11, the priests reject Judas' sin and his confession. This is where Matthew is building. A sinner has walked into the temple has walked into the priest and has said, I have betrayed innocent blood. I need forgiveness. I need mercy. Yes, even Judas Iscariot needed mercy. Can someone say amen? I need some kind of rest. I need some kind of affirmation that this too can be forgiven. And when the priests say no, by extension, the temple is saying, no, you go see that to yourself. So Judas goes and hangs himself. And finally, number 12, the temple, the temple is unable to bring peace and healing. The temple is no longer the place of God's presence. Jesus is. That's where you guys say? That's, we missed that. Let's try that again. <laughs> the temple is no longer the place of God's presence. Jesus is. Much better. Jesus is. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that are what? Laden with sin and guilt and sorrow. Bring that junk to me and I will give you what? Rest. Which raises the question. If Judas Iscariot, if Judas Iscariot had gone to Jesus Instead of going to a lifeless temple and to a lifeless priesthood who didn't care much about him except use him as a conduit to get to Jesus. If Judas Iscariot had gone to Jesus with sincere repentance and sincere despair, what would Jesus tell him? Would he have said the same thing as the religious leader said? See that to yourself, mate. Go figure that one out. Is that what Jesus would have said? No. Jesus would have said the very same thing he told every sinner. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Judas has violated his soul. He has violated his conscience. He has said, I have betrayed innocent blood. I need forgiveness. I need mercy. I need grace. I need some sense of understanding that this too can be forgiven. And he found none at the temple. He found none with the priest. Judas went to the lifeless temple and to a lifeless priesthood when even then he should have gone to the Savior.
The, 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 the significance of this is purposeful. Matthew isn't just saying, well, in the writing this. He is trying to let us know that the temple is no longer the place of God's presence. The temple does not know how to handle sin anymore. The priests don't know what to do with a, with a person who has betrayed their master, who has betrayed their friend, who has betrayed their Lord. And so their response to him is, see that to yourself, mate. We're busy. And in fact, what takes place right after then is that the religious leaders get into a pitiful argument of whether or not it is appropriate or inappropriate to use the money that Judas just bought into the temple's treasury. Because after all, it is blood money. The gravitas of Judas hanging lifeless from a tree is juxtaposed with an insular little argument with the religious leaders amongst themselves of whether or not to use this money that Judas just brought back because it's blood money. Which they knew was the blood money because it was money of betrayal. They are unwilling to put the money into the treasury chest of the temple, but they're willing to shed the blood of the person who was brought them because of that money. Mercy. They're having a little argument amongst themselves about how to use this money when there is someone hanging from a tree, lifeless, who was seeking for forgiveness, for mercy, for grace, for restoration. Craig S. Kinner writes on this on the commentary of the Gospel of Matthew. He says, this narrative also further indicts the heartlessness of the priestly leadership who value laws of ritual purity more highly than their God-given responsibility as shepherds of other lives among their people. Lest modern Christians be tempted to conceive these leaders as ethnic rather than political and religious terms. He's saying, don't think of these guys as just merely Jews. They're just people. We should take note how many churches today seem more concerned about petty church rules than about the life and death needs in the communities around them. Lord, have mercy. They're very uh, careful on how to keep their in-house rules, but they care nothing about a man who is seeking for forgiveness. I wonder, church, if we ever are like that. Mercy. He continues, the leader's blatant unconcern for justice or for his life contrasts starkly with their attention to purity on details. And Jesus even indicts the religious leaders in, in Matthew 23. He says, you pay tithe of mint and cumin and, and anise. He says, yo, you're so nice. You're so good. You're so fastidious. You like to divide one cumin seed out of the other nine cumin seeds. You like to separate one anise seed from the other nine anise seeds. One mint leaf from the other nine mint leaves. But you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, love, justice, and mercy. And here comes Judas seeking just that, love, justice, and mercy. And what he gets is just total neglect. See that to yourself. Is it any wonder why he committed suicide? Are you beginning to see Judas in a maybe different light than what maybe the directors of Hollywood are portraying him to be? I hope so. This is critical. Religion may fail us, but Jesus never will. Religion may fail you. Your church may fail you. Your denomination may fail you. Your pastor may fail you. Even I, I know it's hard to believe, but even I can fail you. I can disappoint you. I can hurt you. Religion may fail you. The church may fail you. But Jesus never will. And what's happening today is people are going to religion, people are going to Jesus, uh, to a church where they should be going to Jesus. Right? I wonder if we, when people come to us with messy situations, with their sin, with their guilt, with their shame, I wonder if we, like the religious leaders, tell them, see that to yourself. I'm too busy. There's too much going on in my life. Go fix your problems, and when you have your ducks lined up, come to us and we'll help you. I hope that's not the case, beloved. I hope that's not the case. Another thing that's happening is that guilt has to go somewhere. Guilt has to do what? I didn't realize how dry it gets up here when you speak. 
Okay. Guilt has to go somewhere. When Judas comes to the priests and he says, I have betrayed my master. I have sinned. Right? He is coming with despair because he knows that the temple is the place where sacrifices are made. Right? The blood is spilled and the sinner can be released and be go home free. Right? But he doesn't get that. He doesn't see any of that. He is now holding on to his guilt. He's holding on to his what? He's retaining his guilt. See, guilt needs to be discharged. It doesn't just sit so nicely within us. Right? It's like sand. When you go to the beach and you have fun and then you're about to go home, you get that stuff in your hair, your hands, it's between your toes, and you just want to go home and shower. Is it me or is it all of you? It's all of us, right? We just don't like that stuff. See, well, you can wallow in sin. You can have a great time in sin. But sin needs to be discharged somehow. Because if it sticks to you, if, it, if you retain your sin, you will be destroying yourself. You're going to implode. It will be self-destructing. And it might not end up like Judas. You might not hang yourself from a tree. But you might act out in different ways, right? You might be starting a new habit. You might start drinking or self-medicating or every other uh, distraction under the sun, whether it's watching movies all the time and TV shows and, and music and, and the games, just so your mind can be distracted so you don't see yourself as you really are, a sinner in need of grace, full of shame and guilt, and that guilt has to be discharged because if it has any remaining power in you, it will destroy you in the same way it destroyed Judas. Guilt has to go somewhere. Now let's go to Pilate. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27. Let's begin verse 11. The Bible says, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. Three times this phrase comes up over and over again. It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. The reason that Pilate is marveling greatly is because in Roman law, if the accused was being bombarded with accusations and they were throwing hurls of accusations on him, and if he did not give a rebuttal, if he did not stand up for himself, it was assumed that he was guilty. So when Jesus is standing there and the mob is just throwing all these accusations against him, and, and you can just sense Pilate's frustration. It's like, oh, come on, man. Say something. Make a defense for yourself. Do you not hear what these guys are saying against you? Stand up for yourself. And, and Pilate was, was a nobody. He was a two-bit governor in the province of Rome. And if he hadn't killed Jesus, you wouldn't know who he was. So he's trying to make a case. Come on, Jesus, say something, say something. Are you the king of the Jews? Because if you don't say that, I'm duty-bound by my own law to get you either crucified or scores or whatever. Are you the king of the Jews? And what is his response? What does the text say? It is as you say. It's as you say. When, when, when the betrayer, Judas, leaned over on the, on the chest of Jesus and he says, am I the betrayer? It is as you say. When the religious leaders uh, at the trial said, tell us once and for all, are you the son of God? It is as you say. And now you have the governor. Are you the king of the Jews? So what I wanted to do is I looked at some different translations. Where's my clicker? There it is. I looked at some different translations to see how some different versions of the Bible translate this. It's pretty cool. It is as you say. You say so. You have said it. Those are your words. If you say so. Am I the betrayer? Are you the son of God? Are you the king of the Jews? If you say so. Jesus is trying to tell him, this is your doing. You have said it. You have said it. It's as you say. Let's continue. Let's read verse 15. 
Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. I find this very uh, interesting that the tradition of the governor was to release a prisoner on Passover. And Passover was the holiday that commemorated the freedom that the Jews received in Egypt. They were slaves, they were set free, and that was Passover. They passed over. And the governor's tradition is to release a prisoner on Passover. I just found that very ironic. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? Pilate thinks that he is obviously setting up the easiest choice here. Right? Who do you want me to release to you? This criminal, the notorious criminal who is a, a rapist, he's a burglar, he's a thief, he's a liar, he's killed people, he's been in and out of jail. Do you want me to release this guy to you? Or this, this messiah-looking figure who won't even say a word, this philosopher, sage kind of guy. Who do you want me to release to you? And he's shocked when he hears what? Don't say it. Don't be like them. <laughs> he's shocked when the crowd says, Barabbas. Look at verse 18 and 19. It says, for he knew that they had handed him over because of what? Envy. Now verse 19, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him saying, have nothing to do with this just man. For I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. Matthew cannot stop telling the story that women get a right and men get a wrong. Can the woman say? Yeah. Amen. It's not... Pilate here who's trying to sort out the situation, it's who? His wife. In the house of Simon, when, when Mary was anointing the feet of Jesus and Judas was beside himself, who was getting it right? Mary, the woman. That's another subtext of, of Matthew. The women are getting it right, the men are getting it wrong, and then we're going to see in the end of Matthew how the women are the ones who are telling the story of the resurrection. The women get it right, the men get it wrong. Just like Jesus, he takes the seemingly insignificant and the seemingly weak and he uses them to proclaim the good news, to confound the wise. When society deems this person to be lower than you, Jesus takes that person and raises that person up. Amen? Women get it right and men get it wrong. <laughs> Man, I'm sorry, but I got to stay true to the text. And woman, I love you too. <laughs> All right. Chapter, tw uh, chapter 27, beginning from verse 20, the Bible says, But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes, they were good uh, salesmen, persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said Barabbas. It's like, come on, tell me, who do you want? We want Barabbas. What? Barabbas? Why? Why Barabbas? Why not Jesus? What do you want me to do with this Jesus guy? And what are the response? Crucify him. What? Crucify him. Crucifixion is given to the most malignant of brigands, the most terrible criminals. Why crucifixion? What has he done? And they kept saying all the more, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And this is when Pilate realizes that this isn't a political thing. It's a religious thing. It's a what thing? Yeah, there's professional jealousy and professional envy. And when he realizes that this big mess, I mean, he woke up that morning and he's like, ah. Oh. And then all of a sudden, this big thing just falls on top of his administrative desk. He's like, oh, how, do I, how, do I, how do I get this mess out of, my, out of my life? I mean, I wasn't expecting this. He has this mob outside who is screaming for crucifixion. He has this quiet Messiah who, who won't say anything. And he really doesn't care for either one of them. He doesn't care if Barabbas is set free. He doesn't really care if Jesus is set free. So he's like, oh, I don't want anything to do with this. And I just, I want to, uh, this, is, this is not me. So what he does is verse um, 24 is when Pilate saw that he could not prevail. And by the way, check this out. In verse 18, it says that he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. So Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. In verse 19, his wife tells him this guy's a just man. He knows he's innocent. In verse 23, he says, what evil has he done? 
Again, he's affirming. Matthew is telling us, Pilate is telling us that Jesus is innocent. But when this thing is just heaped up upon him and he doesn't want to deal with the sticky situation, but the hard mess he has in front of him, he does what any weakling would do. In verse 24, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water, he washed his hands before the multitude. And what does he say? I am innocent of what? And then he says, no, what does he say right after that? You see to it. Ironic how it comes full circle. When Judas had come to the priest, I have betrayed innocent blood. What was their response? You see to it. Now the priests are bringing Jesus, crucify him. You see to it. Everyone is passing the buck here. No one wants to take their moral responsibility. When, when Judas came, oh, this is just too messy, it's just too big, I don't want to deal with this, you see to it. This sticky situation with Jesus is just too messy, I don't want to deal with this, you see to it. And Jesus said, for by your own words, you will be what? By your own words, you will be? Am I the betrayer? If you say so. Are you the king of the Jews? If you say so. Are you the son of God? If you say so. And we do the same thing all the time. We have this really nonchalant ways of trying to hide ourselves. I'm sorry. If I have said something to offend you, Sister Nora, I'm sorry. When you know really well you have offended her and you've broken her heart, right? We don't want to see who we really are. So we hide behind these sayings, right? Three nights ago, Wednesday night, I, I came home from Bible study and I was so depressed. I was so, I just went home and I opened up my laptop and then began to like finish up on the sermon. And I was just, I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. I left home, I went for a walk about 45 minutes, and I'm praying, and I'm weeping, I'm crying. I'm like, Lord, remove this guilt. I see my, myself as you see me. I'm a sinner in need of grace. And I dared ask Jesus, Lord, show me my Judas-like qualities. Lord, have mercy. We cannot escape who we really are. In our innermost souls, when we turn the TV off, when we turn the music off, the television, the, the movies, the games, the sports, the video games, the social media, when we turn all of these things off and we just sit in the quietudeness and in the stillness and we ask God, as I dared ask him, show me my own Judas-like traits, you will be shocked on how much you are like Judas. The guilt, the shame will kick in. Then you'll have an option. Do I retain this or do I discharge this? If you retain it, you're going to end up like Judas. You're going to destroy yourself. Whether that's movies or alcohol or, or you know, going out with friends all the time or always on social media just so you don't have to avoid being quiet and self-examining yourself. Or you can take it to Jesus and have him wash you from your sins. Amen? Where's my clicker? Okay. In cowardice and political expediency, Pilate chooses the path of least resistance. You take care of it. The priests and Pilate want nothing further to do with the situation and wash their hands of it. That's too messy. I, this Judas thing is too messy. This, this Jesus thing is too messy. You see to it. But Jesus will not go away easily, beloved. He cannot be dismissed so quickly and casually. Can the church say amen? In the same way that sin sticks to you like a leech, Jesus is after you like a lover. He wants to embrace you and take you away from sin, only if you let him, though. Now check this one out. This is crazy. Astonishingly, the people embrace the moral responsibility the priests and Pilate sought to what? Wait. Okay, okay, okay. You don't want to deal with, with Judas? We'll deal with him. Pilate, you don't want to deal with Jesus? We will deal with it. And what is the response? Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And you would think, you would think that this is a term of condemnation and derision, which it is. But at the very same time, they are inviting upon themselves the very thing that brings salvation. 
May his blood be upon us. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let his blood be upon us. They're saying that in condemnation, but in reality, the blood is the only way that will save them. A couple more slides and we're going to close. N.T. Wright in his book, Matthew for Everyone, says, And as both sides use the weapon that matched their particular type of claim, we, the gospel readers, are invited to watch in awe to see which of the two, the power of aggression translated into a justice system designed to suit the rulers, or the power of silence, suffering, and love is in fact vindicated by God. See, God's heart is to receive violence and pain, not to inflict it. Let me say that again. God's heart is to what? Receive violence and pain, not to inflict it. He didn't come to put people on crosses. He came to be put on the cross so you can be set free. And when Jesus dies on Passover, no less, Barabbas goes free. Pilate is there. He's like, what do you want me to do with Jesus? Crucify him. What about Barabbas? Set him free. So Jesus is condemned, Barabbas goes free, and it happens on Passover. Jesus is condemned, Barabbas goes free, and when does that happen? On Passover. N.T. Wright continues, the point for Matthew is that all are guilty. The chief priests are guilty, the elders are guilty, the disciples are guilty, Peter is guilty, Judas is guilty, the mob is guilty, Pilate is guilty, the Roman uh, soldiers are guilty, everyone is guilty. The chief priests and elders who hand, uh, have handed Jesus over, Pilate the weak bully, and the crowds themselves. And part of the reason for stressing universal guilt is that with the death of Jesus, redemption is offered to how many? To all. What happened close up in sharp focus to Barabbas is now open to all. When Jesus dies as king of the Jews, he draws upon himself the guilt and death of Israel and thence also of the world. Because remember, guilt has to go somewhere. If you retain that guilt, if you retain that darkness, that bleakness, it's going to destroy you. And there's no better place than to take it and give it and hand it over to Jesus. Right? If Judas had gone to Jesus, he would have received mercy. He would have received compassion. He would have received forgiveness. Oftentimes we may go to our pastors, we may go to our church, we may go to the religious leaders, and they will let you down. But if you go to Jesus, he will never do what? Never let you down. He is a faithful friend in need. If you don't, you're going to hold on to that guilt, and that guilt will kill you. Now I'm going to make an appeal. I'm going to make an altar call. I know we don't do this often, but I'm going to make an appeal in the altar call, and the altar call is based on these three characters, Judas, Pilate, and Barabbas. And I'm going to ask you, if any one of these fits you, to come forward and to give that guilt, to give that sin, to give that shame to Jesus this morning. You know, I was thinking the past two weeks, man, am I just a preacher? Am I just a guy who knows the Bible and people come up to and ask questions? I come to church, I dress nice, hopefully. Am I just that guy that people come up to and say, hey, hey, he's a Bible guy. What about you, Jesus? Do you have me? And I ask God, Lord, show me if there's any identifying markers in my life with Judas, with Pilate, and with Barabbas. And you know what? It's easy to do. The shoe fit. So I'm asking you this morning. I need this back on, guys. I need the slides back on. I'm asking you this morning, if you have guilt, if you have shame, if you have sin that you're holding on to, to bring it, to leave it 
right here with Jesus. I am Judas. I am often with Jesus, but not with him. I look out for myself and for my own interests. Always have an eye on the exit strategy. If you think that, that's me, just come on forward. I am frustrated often with Jesus and his decisions in my life. I'm in for the kingdom, but I'm not all in. I criticize others, and I think I'm better than them. And lastly, I settle for association with God over intimacy with God. If any of the shoes fit you, I'm going to ask you to right now to come forward and bring that guilt, and bring that shame, and bring that sin to Jesus. We will not say, go see to that to yourself. That's your business. Go figure that out on your own. I am Judas. How about this one? I am Pilate. I think my ignorance will acquit me. Some of us are too careful not to read too many religious books, not to listen to too many sermons, because we know that we will be held accountable. And you know that's true. Ignorance is not bliss, guys, when it comes to spiritual things. I am Pilate. I waver on moral decisions. When I have the option of doing the right from the wrong, from choosing the left from the right, from doing the, right, uh, the white from the black, I always choose the wrong thing. I waver on moral decisions. I am a people pleaser, but not a God pleaser. Yep, that's the shoe. That's the shoe that fits. Just come on forward. I want space for everyone here. Doesn't matter who's watching you. If the Spirit is speaking to your heart, just come forward. I knowingly violate my conscience. I'm going to be honest with you, church, and I'm not trying to manipulate you. I can't imagine that anyone cannot respond to this one unless you're a different person than I am. I knowingly violate my conscience. I take the path of least resistance. When I'm stuck in a, a sticky situation, a hard, messy situation, I think to myself, how can I get out of this quickly? I take the path of least resistance. I'm a Judas. So maybe you might be a, a Judas like me, or maybe you might be a pilot like me. Or maybe you're a Barabbas. I am a notorious sinner. If you realize that your shame and guilt is in you and you want to release it to Jesus today, just come forward. I do not deserve mercy. I do not deserve freedom. I do not deserve Jesus' death in place of mine. It's the glass slipper. Just come on forward. I am Barabbas. The name Barabbas means son of the father. Jesus goes to the cross and Barabbas, the son of the father, is set free. You are condemned guilty, but Jesus goes to the cross for you. And you are Barabbas, the son of the father, goes free. And by God's grace, I am. I'm saved. We're going to be singing the song, and the words of that song will be up on the screen right now. And I'm going to invite you to bring your guilt, to bring your shame, to bring your sin, that meanness, that, that insularity, that uh, disingenuineness, that self-centeredness, that selfishness, that blackness, all that goop, all that stuff that you retain. Bring it to Jesus this morning. For all the Judases, for all the Pilots, and for all the Barabbases, we bring our guilt to Jesus right now. We're going to be singing this song right now. I will follow thee, my Savior. And I want you guys to sing as an act of worship, as an act of thankfulness to the Lord, as you're leaving your sin with Jesus. Let us sing.
This video was recorded from Central Filipino Seventh-day Adventist Church to help prepare people for the soon return of Jesus Christ. If you would like to visit us and for more information, go to www.centralfilipino.org.